to you which has to do with the active engagement in freedom of thought which materialises in the striving for uh, political liberty on the ground as it were but, but also I think this Latin tag dare to know has a curiously romantic ring to it we were talking about the various meanings of romanticism itself in the last 200 years so that it's rather as though Kant is positioning himself absolutely at a watershed of the end of one historical period or movement known as the Enlightenment uh, and anticipating the more romantic aspects of dare to know in that one phrase or one tag so he's a, a really rather pivotal figure when he uses his Latin phrase to straddle uh, the difference between Enlightenment and Romanticism. So is it the case that Romanticism is a reaction against the Enlightenment then? It's against science, against reason, against universal laws? Because what we get in the later 19th century when the French Revolution seems to be perceived as a kind of failure, particularly because of the terror, um, there's there is this idea, well, maybe Prometheus shouldn't have touched that fire. Maybe he should have left it uh, up there. Um, and, I mean, there's a religious re revival, for example, in the 19th century that is also associated with Romanticism. This very building we're, we're sitting in, it's physical evidence of that. Mm. Uh, many of the chapels here were built in, in that period of this religious revival. So... Can we explore that? We've only got a few more minutes left. Uh, the, the romanticism is a reaction against the Enlightenment. Yes. If the, uh, if the French Revolution is a political uh, revolution in the culture of the day is unfolding through the 1770s, 80s and 90s, uh, one, one of the other uh, revolutionary forces contemporaneously is the, uh, the industrial movement and change and transformation of the time uh, and it's perhaps those manifestations of uh, uh, a rationalist attitude world view or outlook uh, which is increasingly contained in or embodied by uh, the factories and workshops that are springing up around the country in Britain for example uh, it's that manifestation of a preceding age of revolution uh, which, which I think uh, our romantic uh, writers and artists are, are, are wanting to sort of take the opportunity to revalue how that form of abstract reason uh, is making its presence felt across the social landscape of w uh, Western Europe at this time it might be useful, therefore, to make this distinction between different kinds of revolutionary activity. The political culture of the French Revolution, the industrial transformation of England becoming the workshop of the world uh, from the late 18th into the 19th century. What I'd like to ask, and maybe the students would like to chip in as well, um, is what has romanticism, if we accept that term for the sake of argument, bequeathed to the contemporary world. Um, it seems to me one of those, well, first of all, some sub sublime poetry, brilliantly well technically constructed poetry, some tremendous music from Beethoven, but the idea of nationalism, which has been such a problem uh, in the 20th century and may yet become a problem in the Arab world, we're discussing it now, Arab nationalism, highly problematical. So we're going to have to see how that's that's going to work out. Yeah. So can we go around between us from what we know from our different perspectives and, and think what Romanticism has given us now here today? It didn't give us this microphone, for example. I think this primarily comes from uh, the Enlightenment, Newton, science, so we might be wrong about that. Yes. But it gave us what we're talking about, perhaps. Yes. Um, Ali? You say that nationalism is a problem, is, is what you've called it, but it's more of a problem for the imperial powers, isn't it? So for, for Britain, the national, nationalistic India and the other colonies that they had to give up, and the same for France and uh, Spain and so on, and all of them 
in the post-war era, that's a problem for the sort of great powers. It's also today more a problem for America. Um, is it necessarily a problem for the people? Isn't isn't romanticism more about the people, not about these oppressors? And then so isn't it less a problem and more them throwing off the shackles of well, that's a good and, and good and provocative question. But if you were Kurdish, you might well take a different view of uh, Arab nationalism. Just to look at one of the many, many problems of nationalism. But uh, as my students know, I am. Uh, I shouldn't do this; it's unprofessional. But I am not a nationalist. I don't. I personally don't like nationalism, so I'm probably bending over too far the other way. But let's bring other people in for listing. Um, so nationalism is just a love of your country, right? In general. Is that, is that it? I've heard it's, it's also sort of uh, about national heritage. I, all, all the people share a language, perhaps a religion, and a national history. Um, so it does it is sort of exclusive. Like using the example of Kurds in Iraq, they would be the minority, and so they would be excluded from the nationalism of the majority who, who would be Arabs and for example here English or British national, nationalism would um, yeah, be for more white people basically yeah. the people who have lived here thousands of years and less so for the immigrants of the last 100 or 200 years would um, be less affected by nationalism or would be excluded by nationalism. I don't know. It's a nice thing in theory that then obviously the problems it like throws up like racism. It's just I don't know. Yeah. There's no way around it though. I think that uh, white, uh, white past white people seems to have been sort of the uh, the yeah. next attachment of the Nick Griffin parties. <laughs> but kind of their propaganda. There was a, there was a huge amount of poetry and novels and literature written about uh, the, our glorious national past in in in, uh, in all schools of romantic thought, uh, Carlyle in in Britain and uh, the, the kind of invent Ossie and the Gale and the kind of yes. reinvention of a of a of a of a great and glorious national past by by all these contending groups who unfortunately live together on the same continents and so forth. Yes. And but well, uh, before I <laughs> give my view away entirely, can we? Can you tell us a little more about romantic nationalism? Well, exactly. I mean, I, w I want to uh, a answer your question about the greatest gift that romanticism has given to modernity. And I, I think I can try to give an answer to that in relation to these views about nationalism per se. If I say that the greatest gift of romanticism to modernity is William Blake's hymn Jerusalem, mm. which, which is supremely that poetic text which has been claimed by all manner of uh, political persuasion across uh, uh, the political spectrum. Uh, it's sung as a hymn at uh, Often women's... Often it should be the national anthem. It's the, it's the unofficial national anthem. Uh, it's sung as enthusiastically by uh, Billy Bragg as it is by public school boys, by members of the Women's Institute. Uh, which is to suggest perhaps that these, these currents of nationalism are flowing through the Romantic era. I think they're not invented by the Romantics themselves. Britain as a nation dates from 1707, the Act of Union, which puts us back into that earlier age of... 1923, actually, when the, Very good. when the Republic of Ireland was formed in, in this geographical area we call Britain. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what, you know, one of the wonderful things about uh, William Blake's hymn Jerusalem is if it indeed is the unofficial uh, hymn of this fully formed entity called Britain is that uh, it seems to give expression uh, in, in terms of its poetic imagery to this marked diversity of uh, political thought uh, and currency uh, and it's on this basis on which I commend it to all of us as a, 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 a vital signification of national interest nationalist interest into the early 21st century that, that's uh, very very interesting, anything more on that? one, one very last thing which you did raise in the lecture um, is a, 
quite difficult area, technical area in philosophy. You've mentioned uh, Immanuel Kant, and, and you presented for us this uh, tremendously affecting, affecting poem. Uh, I think uh, the the uh, the Grecian uh, ode, um, and this stunning uh, statement: that truth is beauty, 